Welcome to Ambo TV. Each week we bring you dynamic sermons from next generation pastors from across the country. And as always, they're bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God. And then we discuss them right here in studio. I'm your host, Dean. Hashtag always blessed Windsor. And today we have another great show for you. We have sermons from Washington, Montana, and Georgia. We also have interviews with the cast of the new movie, The Clark Sisters, The First Ladies of Gospel. So awesome. Stick around. You're not going to want to miss it. And first up is Pastor Daniel Fusco at Crossroads Community Church in Vancouver, Washington. He's talking about their vision for this year, and it deals with renewal and serving others. This is going to be really great. It's my favorite thing to do is serve. And then we go to Kalispell, Montana to Fresh Life Church with Pastor Levi Lusco. His message is called wash your hands. Not only does he want you to actually wash your hands because hello germs, ew, but he's talking about the basics and the importance of focusing on those small things that really matter. Then we're going down south to Forsyth, Georgia with Pastor Gerald Fadiomi. He's in their overrated sermon series and he's talking about status and how it's overrated. He wants us to know that what matters is not status but our service to God and others. Can you kind of see a theme going here? Lastly, our producer Brooke Gurley shares her interview with some of the stars of the new biopic, The Clark Sisters, the first ladies of gospel. Yes, we love gospel here at Ambo. So stick around and see the cast talk about playing these iconic women. And I'll be joined in studio by returning guest, Pastor Darrell Rich of the River Church in New Jersey. He's going to help me break down these awesome messages. But right now, let's go to Vancouver, Washington with Pastor Daniel Fusco. Hey, if you didn't bring a Bible with you to church, all the books on the seats in front of you, those are Bibles. Best thing we can have for you there. We want you to pull that thing open, or if you have a favorite uh, smartphone or a phone with some intelligence, you type in Isaiah 40, verse 31. If you're new to the Bible, it's easy to find the book of Isaiah because it's the second longest book in your Bible. The longest book is the book of Psalms. It's 150 Psalms. If you hit Psalms, and if you flip around, you're gonna hit a Psalm at some point. Just turn to your right a couple of books. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, 66 chapters in the prophet Isaiah. And we're taking the very last verse of Isaiah chapter 40 as our theme of this year of renewal. Look at what it says. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, what I love about this verse is if you put it in context, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to the children of Israel at a time when life was really complicated, right? They were being oppressed by the Assyrian army. Life was getting very challenging for the children of Israel, and they were beginning to falter under all the pressures. And so God raised up this mouthpiece, the prophet Isaiah, to come and speak into the midst of the children of Israel. Now, the reason I think this verse is so important for us is because we live in a day and age where the pressure and the temperature feels like it's rising, doesn't it? We, they talk about the generation that we're living in right now as an age of outrage, where everybody is outraged. And, and depending on where you find yourself in all these different categories that people put themselves in, you have your own set of things to be angry about, right? I, I, was, I tried to do it this week to like, I wanna write down all the things we're supposed to be outraged about this week. I made it through about halfway through Monday and I was getting carpal tunnel. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you just you flip around. Like, people are angry about, obviously, both sides of the political aisle. There's all sorts of anger, right? People are angry about the economy. Man, people are angry about chicken sandwiches today. I mean, what a world we live in. People are fighting about chicken sandwiches, right? People get, and then it's like TV shows, TV shows that I didn't even know was on TV anymore. People are angry about everything. And that is on top of all the normal pressures that we all have in our lives, health problems and fears of the future and these things. And really what you have is we have a world where it feels like a pressure cooker and we live in a culture that's cracking all over the place. And the culture that we live in, that, those dynamics are not unlike what was going on in the life of the prophet Isaiah and the people, the children of Israel. So this verse speaks right into how does God do fresh things in a pressure cooker world? And what I want to show you to start, before I unpack what we see as God's vision for Crossroads in 2020, this year of renewal, is I don't want you to miss the fact that when they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was in Matthew 22, he answered it, right? They said, what's the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. 
It's the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here at Crossroads, what do we call that? Upward, inward, and outward, right? Now, yes, I did write a book by that title because it's so fundamental. They said Jesus is the most important thing. It's upward, why? Because the most important thing in life is that you experience God's love. That's upward. The relationship that God wants to have with you, right? That's the upward piece. And then, because of that, then we love our neighbor as what? Ourselves. That's inward. God's love for us shows us who we are. Everybody tells us what we are. You're this, you're that, you're no good, you're super good. People say all sorts of things. None of that matters. All that matters is who God says that you are. And when you experience God's love, then God teaches you how to love yourself the way he loves you. Not in a self-aggrandizing way, but in a super humble biblical way. That's the inward. And of course, the upward God and the inward, our identity leads us where? Outward, to love our neighbors, into the world. The reason the world is breaking down is because everyone's upward, people's upwards are all messed up, which makes their inward all messed up, and they treat each other messed up. Now, the reason I bring that up is not only is that foundational to who we are as a church, but don't miss the fact that Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, is upward, inward, and outward. Right? Notice. Those who wait on the Lord. That's upward. It doesn't say just be a patient person. Wait on the universe. You wait on the Lord, right? So it begins upward. And when we wait on the Lord, it says, what will happen? He shall renew your strength. That's the inward. When we learn how to wait upon God in the midst of a pressure cooker world, then God's strength, he imparts it to us by faith, and our strength becomes renewed. We get a refreshed strength, the strength that we didn't have. In the midst of all the issues and pressures and struggles of life, waiting on the Lord, hoping in the Lord, having a confidence upward leads us to his strength and that strength gets renewed and then when the upward hits the inward, then it spills out outward and look at what happens. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. All right, there's Pastor Daniel Fusco. And joining us today is returning guest, <laughs> Pastor Darrell Rich. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, good to see you again. All right, awesome. Let's go ahead. Let's just unpack mm -hmm. really quickly. So I'm like rarely outraged. I kind of expect all the bad things to happen all the time. So, okay. <laughs> so this one didn't touch me that hard. But he does touch on these three points, which is uh, upward, inward, and then mm -hmm. outward. So it, is it that simple though? Can like those three tenants really like secure prosperity and you know goodness in our lives and peace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, actually I think it is that simple. Really? Yeah, okay. but <laughs> as with most simple things, uh, they're often the most challenging mm. as well. So, you know, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. But it's like, okay, well, first of all, who is my neighbor? <laughs> and secondly, like, how do I love myself? And like, so all, I, I think simple things are a lot more complex than we think. Okay. So this idea of upward, inward, and outward, yeah, in theory, it works. Okay. You know, but actually putting that to the challenge. So what does it mean to love God? You know, that's the first yeah. thing. How do I get to know God? How do I really get um, in in deeper relationship with God. Secondly, like dealing with kind of contextual, like environmental nurturing, mm. you know, the things that cause me to see myself a particular way. So that's the inner kind of okay. stuff. Like you gotta navigate, really push through those things. Okay. You know, if you grew up in a context where you were told like, oh, you know, you're nothing, you'll never be nothing. Mm. Like that's difficult to love yourself then. Yes, you absolutely. Know? And then outward, you know, again, like what if you're not loving me so, and I'm still required to love you. So I think it is yeah. as simple as he said it is, but it's also as challenging yeah. as he's not saying it is. All right. Well, I mean, now, now that you put it like that, <laughs> now I'm feeling like there's a lot more to unpack there. And we'll get back to Pastor Daniel Fusco in a little bit. But right now we're going to take a break and we'll be back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, bringing you next generation pastors from across the country. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Daniel Fusco, but right now I want to get to Pastor Levi Lusco and Calus Bell, Montana. Let's check them out. If you take the time to slow, you, that's, that, that's not, 
That's not fast. <laughs> Sit there and think, I mean, you're never going to forget that. The rest of your life, you're like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Baby steps. Baby <laughs> steps to the trash can, right? Baby steps. You, but that's inefficient, time-wise. But there's less waste because of it. I'm telling you if, you, if you take the time to slow down long enough to pray, if you take the time to begin a year by seeking God through fasting, you will see a better version of you because of that inefficient use of your time. Don't you notice that it's so easy just to tear through life at, at warp speed, multitasking all the time? CNN on, and a thing over here, and oh, yeah, I got to watch that on Netflix. And uh, just always something to do. And we're all kind of feeling that like smoldering fear of missing out, right? Because I'm here, but is there something better going on? Did I not get invited? Are they having fun without me? And as a result, we're, we, we can sometimes not be present anywhere. Ravi Zacharias, in uh, his book, The Logic of God, he talks about how there was a day when he was in Russia at a museum. His wife wanted to see some paintings, and he tolerated it. Went to the museum with her, and she was looking at all the paintings, and he was like, come on, honey, let's go. Come on, kind of at her elbow the whole time. Let's get through this. We got to get out of here. Got to speak. Got to go to the airport. And so he, he didn't really get anything out of the experience. And later on, a couple years went by, he was reading a book by Henry Nouwen. And in the book, Henry Nouwen talks about how he sought out a time in his life to go to St. Petersburg, Russia, and go to that exact museum. Because he had seen uh, a duplication of a painting by Rembrandt on the prodigal son, the return of the prodigal son, and he wanted to see the real thing. And so he got on a plane, flew all the way to Russia just to see this painting, and went to the exact museum that Ravi had blazed through and found the painting. And when he found it, he sat down on a bench and stared at it for four hours. And in the book, Ravi, I mean, it's too long, but the book Ravi was reading, he was, he, he was, Henry was saying, that day changed my life. While looking at that painting, God so spoke to me clearly about what I was to do with my life and how I was to transition out of one career go into another career. So life was never the same from Henry, for Henry because of what God did while looking at that painting. And Ravi says, reading that book, he felt like such an idiot because he had looked at that exact same painting and got nothing out of it because he saw it in a hurry. And then in the book, Ravi concludes it by quoting A.W. Tozer from Tozer's devotional, Mornings with God, where he says, and I quote, I have often wished that there was some way to bring modern Christians into a deeper spiritual life painlessly by short, easy lessons. But such wishes are in vain. No shortcuts exist. May not the inadequacy of much of our spiritual experience be traced back to our habit of skipping through the corridors of the kingdom like little children through the marketplace, chattering about everything but pausing to learn the true value of nothing. God has not bowed to our nervous haste nor embraced the methods of our machine age. It is well that we accept the hard truth now. The man, don't, listen, don't miss this, the man who would know God must give time to him. Or as another theologian put it, if you end your training now, if you choose the quick and easy path as Vader did, you will become an agent of evil. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> now we've, we've gone from Yoda to, to Tozer. And in it all, what we're discovering is that you, we all need to be slowed down a little bit, to not rush into our day, to not rush into another year without pausing. That's what this fast is. It's to disrupt our schedule. It's to disrupt, disrupt the, the regularly scheduled broadcasting that is your life. Because you're going to blink, and it's going to be gone. You're going to blink, and you're going to be at the end. So this is a chance to say, hold on a second. I want to I smell the flowers that God has put in this world. All right, Pastor Levi, let's go. Uh, Pastor, help me out here. Because I'm one of these guys. Like I'm one of these guys. I got to post this. I got to go there. Mm. I got to do that. How do I slow it down, you know, in a more practical way? Like, what's, what's a way that I can slow down to give God the priority that he deserves? Mm. I think one of the basic things you can do is actually, like, do an audit of your time. Oh, okay. So, like, just sit down one day and, and really just write out how much time you're spending in each matter. So, if it's, you know, an hour getting dressed in the morning, an hour, you know, for breakfast, whatever it is, but add in those other things like social media, 
that'll give you a clear picture of like, oh shoot, I'm spending like three hours a day, you know, four hours a day um, on social media stuff. Mm. Um, and then from there, you know, you can kind of augment. Um, one of the things that I often do is take time to meditate, to be still, to recenter myself. My dad, uh, he would always say to me, um, like when I got anxious or you know excited about something, be still. <laughs> just, I like that. Just be still. Yes. And then as I got older, you know, then he started to quote the scripture. You know, be still and know. Yeah. You know, everything's gonna be fine. I love that. Yeah. Be still. Some of the best advice I've ever gotten. And with that being said, let's head over to Pastor Fatiomi at Mountain Lake Church. And we see this in every area of our life. We are constantly climbing ladders. And oftentimes as we climb these ladders, the reason that we're doing that is because we're really pursuing one word, and the word is simple, it's status. Like we're pursuing status. We are trying to get to a certain level, to a certain position, to a certain place. And so we climb the ladder over and over and over, hoping to eventually get to the position that we're hoping for, the status that we're hoping for. For a lot of us, as you think about your New Year's resolutions or the goals that you have for this year, when you really boil them down, they come back to this word status. Like maybe for you, your goal for this year is to get a certain promotion or to lead a certain part of your company or to end up being the boss and, and kind of having the weight and the responsibility and the power that comes with that. For some of you, maybe you're still in college in the room and your goal is to graduate with honors. And so you're doing all this work. You're climbing the ladder to graduate with honors. Or if you're in high school, your goal is to get the valedictorian. And so you're doing all this work so that you can eventually reach this status. Maybe you're a mom in the room and your goal, your, your resolution, your plan is just to be the best mom in the neighborhood. And so you go to all the PTA meetings and you do all of the things that you need to do in order to reach the status. Here's the thing. I don't know what it is for you, but what I do know is true that in in a lot of ways, all of us are climbing ladders and we're trying to reach a particular status, but there's a problem with status. The problem with status is this, is that we can spend years of our life trying to climb a ladder to get the position, the promotion, the title, the status, the power that we were looking for, only to find out that it wasn't what we really thought. And that you get to the top of the ladder and there's still a void. You get to the top of the ladder and it still feels like there's something that's missing. We get to the top of the ladder and we're still unsatisfied. I was thinking about this idea and I was reminded um, of a quarterback that most of you have heard of. His name is Tom Brady. I'm really glad that he lost last night, by the way. Um, Tom, if you're, if you're watching this, I just want to say to you, I love you, Jesus loves you, but we don't forgive you for what you did to the Falcons, and so we're glad, karma, it happens. I don't even believe in karma, but you got it, right? Like, um. <laughs> but I was thinking about Tom Brady and, and reminded of an interview that he had on 60 Minutes where he said this. He said, there's times where I'm not the person that I want to be. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what is. I've reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me? I thank God there has to be more than this. I mean, this can't be all that it's cracked up to be. I've done it. I'm 27. What else is there for me? Three times Super Bowl champion at this point, married to a Super Bowl, or married to a Super Bowl, married to a supermodel. <laughs> And some would say that he's the Michael Jordan of football. And yet, still goes, something's missing. I've climbed my way to the top of the ladder. I've reached the ultimate status, and, and something is still missing. You see, status is overrated, and the reason why is because status will never satisfy. And for some of us, we've locked our eyes on climbing up the ladder. We've locked our eyes on this promotion. We've locked our eyes on this position. We've locked our eyes on this goal that we've set for the year so that we can reach this particular status. But the reality of reaching that status is you will do whatever it takes to get there, and then you'll get there and realize you're still unsatisfied. Status isn't the goal because status isn't even what you really want. You don't really just want the position. No, what you want is the respect. You don't want to just be seen as the best mom in the neighborhood. No, you want to be loved. You don't want to just be the valedictorian. You want to be seen. You want to be noticed. It's not that we really want status. What we really want is significance. 
What we really want is to matter. What we really want is to be loved, known, respected. And so the better question for us to ask as we kick off a new year is not how can we climb the ladder and get to status. The better question that we should ask is how do we find significance? So I'm really digging this sermon right here mm. because it speaks a lot to me. You know, I gave up a lot to follow my path now that God had put me on. And I mean, I gave up a lot. <laughs> so, and people think I'm crazy. So mm. like, what do we, you know, what do we do, you know, to show people that it's not crazy what we're doing, mm -hmm. you know, when we make these leaps of faith? Yeah, you know, actually, I don't think it's our job to make people think we're not crazy. Okay, like, I like that. I think, <laughs> I think this, the call that we have, it is an invitation to do things that are, quote, kind of abnormal, out of the norm, um, that are risky, okay. you know? Um, so like you, I left a career in architecture and all I wanted to be was an architect okay. since the eighth grade. That's it, you know, <laughs> that's all my family knew. Like, yeah. you know, so then when I started, you know, preaching and, and speaking, that was kind of like, hmm, where's this coming from? <laughs> you know, but I knew that there was, there was something else. Mm. You know, there was this call. I couldn't, I couldn't fully articulate it, but I yeah. knew something else. God was calling me to something else. So I don't think that it's, it's our business, it's our job to make people believe us. Okay. No, we're supposed to just leap as God instructs us. All right. Yeah. There you have it, y'all. Don't spend too much time trying to convince people yeah. you aren't crazy. I, you know, this is faith, and this is what right. we do. We make our leaps. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be right back with more Ambo TV after this break. Yeah. Welcome back to Ambo TV, bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Fadiomi, but right now, I want to get back to Washington and Pastor Daniel Fusco. We want to encounter Jesus in stillness. Now, let me explain this to you. This really speaks about you being quiet in the presence of God. The reason I think this is so important is because in an age of outrage, most of us feel overwhelmed and bombarded by life. Right? And in the midst of so much aggressive bombardment from all these different things, great advances we've had as society, it also is having a, a negative effect on many of us because we're so distracted that we can't settle down at all. And the Bible teaches that we should be still and know that he's God. And I believe that one of the ways God wants to renew each one of us is for each one of us to allow Jesus to do what he wants to do in us in stillness. Now, let me say this, because there are some parts within Christianity that stillness has become so popular that we're not discerning the spirits. Not everything you experience in stillness is good. But that's why we're not just saying we want you to encounter Jesus in stillness. We're saying we want to read the Bible every single day because we want to be led by the scriptures and then we let the scriptures define experiencing God in stillness. The analogy God gave me of this is a young child, especially a baby, everyone loves to hold the baby. But sometimes the only way the baby can settle down is if it's in the arms of one of their beloved parents, right? And the parents hold them close. We've all had that experience if, 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 you've, if you've been a parent, right? where it's like the kids are freaking out and then all of a sudden mom holds them. And all of a sudden it's like, Phew. now that's not always true, but a lot of times it is, right? And in a lot of ways, I think one of the ways Jesus wants to renew each one of us is he wants to draw us close and give us a comfort and a peace that we can only get from him. But we need to find quiet for that. So we're gonna be seeking to experience Jesus and, and encountering Jesus in stillness so that we can be still and know that he's God. And then, of course, the second way is that we want to express Jesus' love through the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. Now, notice I say that we want to express Jesus' love through the gifts of the Spirit. Now, we're talking about the, the, the charismatic gifts of the Spirit here. Now, I realize that there might not be a more controversial thing to talk about than the gifts of the Spirit, but guess what? Because we believe the Bible here, we gotta talk about it. So in, uh, after this four-week series that we do on Renew, I'm gonna do a series called Life Hack, which is all about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Because, because it's such a hotly contested topic, I wanna see what does the Bible say about it? Because what I've learned is the reason it's hotly contested is some people, right, they read the Bible, but they actually don't take the Bible seriously about the gifts, and so the gifts of the spirits become like kind of mayhem on one end. Or because some people believe the Bible and they're seeing the mayhem on one end, then they say, well, obviously that's no good now. And actually, I think both 
our errors, but what does the Bible say? And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at what does the Bible say about who the Holy Spirit is and how he works. And guess what? Because we believe the Bible here, we're just gonna go with that. And so with the gifts of the Spirit, I say that we should be expressing Jesus' love because the the deepest, and I'll be taking this in the next series, the, the biggest exposition of the gifts of the Spirit are 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, right? Now what's amazing is, is chapter 12 and chapter 14 are specifically about specific gifts, but chapter 13 is about what? Love. And that's not, by, that's not by chance. I like to say that 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 create a sandwich. The gifts of the spirit are the bread, but the sandwich, the meat of the sandwich is what? Is love. And people get messed up when they miss the love in the middle and they just focus on the gifts. The gifts are vehicles for God's love to be expressed in the world. And when the gifts of the spirit of the spirit are divorced from the love of God, then all of a sudden we have a big problem. So what I wanna ask you to do is, with this side, both the stillness and with the gifts of the spirit, I just want you to begin to pray. What does it look like for you to take some time to be still in the presence of the Lord? All right, so Pastor Fusco's message, be still mm. in, in, in the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. I'm not a biblical scholar, <laughs> so I need your help here. Mm-hmm. Like, what does that look like? you know, to you, to to be still in the presence of the Lord? Mm. Well, as I said earlier, um, a spiritual discipline of mine is meditation. And so that means actually sitting still um, in a room, um, you know, reading the word, but then like actually meditating on what I've just read. Okay. It also means, and I do this actually even more often, listening to soaking music. Okay. And so, which is like really... Uh, For those of us that don't know. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, it's, <laughs> expand. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's instru- instrumental music. Okay. Um, you know, um, but it's, it's really soothing. Okay. Um, and, and I've noticed that that has been really helpful with me just com- calming my anxieties, calming my, you know, all the things that's running through my mind. But um, I think developing those spiritual practices, those spiritual habits like meditation, like centering, like study, you know, biblical study, really just carving out the time. So again, that's why earlier I mentioned, you know, do do a time audit. See what you're spending your time on and and how you can start to insert these moments of 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 recentering. And so that'll kind of help us slow things out kind of Oh definitely we'll be able to train ourselves to slow down a little bit and focus more on God. I love that so much. And right now, I want to head back over to Pastor Levi Lusco in Kalispell, Montana. There is truly a sense in which the water of the word, when you meet with God in scripture, when you pray to him, the spirit will just cleanse you. There's a cleansing that happens. We, we live in a dirty world. Now, Jesus has cleansed our heart. And this all fulfills the Old Testament. Because when the priest would, would, would represent God, you would go to a priest. We go to Jesus now. We'll talk about how that became possible. But first, you went to a priest. And the priest couldn't just show up to work without first washing their hands. There was a ceremony they went through, a way of saying, like, sinful man can't just stand before God. There has to be a washing. There has to be a sacrifice. But it got perverted. It got distorted. And by the time Jesus showed up, I won't read it to you, but read on your own time, Mark chapter 7, just two chapters to the left from where we sit in Mark 9. Mark 7, there's this amazingly funny story where the disciples of, uh, of the Pharisees and scribes, they come to Jesus and go, hey, why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? And you're like, well, they're onto something. They shouldn't do that. That is gross and unsanitary. It wasn't like an issue of germs. It was an issue of of not going through the rituals that the Pharisees had added on to the tradition. They had made it all about them. They had made it all about what they would do for God. And so they had this huge thing they would go through. They would wash their hands like all showy in public, like I'm too sexy for my shirt and stuff. And they would even like wash their couches all icky weird. And so the Bible says in Mark 7, they came to Jesus having found fault. Sidebar, if you look for faults, you'll always find them. I say in this new year, let's stop looking for faults. Let's look for the good. Let's look for the best in people. You will find whatever you look for. And if you're looking for a reason to get offended, if you're looking for a reason to get hurt, If you look for those things, you'll find them. So they were looking for fault. They found fault with Jesus. He was healing people. Could they have looked for that? He was preaching God's word. Could they have looked for that? But no, they found fault. And Jesus Jesus said, 
My disciples are not going to do your traditions. And Isaiah the prophet put it this way. He said, my people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What the Pharisees didn't understand was the whole culture of washing hands was never meant to be a showy religious thing that was happening on the outside. It was about a supernatural reality that God wanted to do on the inside. It wasn't as much about washed hands as washed hearts. And through you seeking God in prayer and seeking God in scripture, that's what the weekly gatherings are about. That's what the small groups are about. Ever since Jesus rose from the dead, his people have given themselves over as they've grown to large group meetings on the weekend of worship and small group meetings for life change and discipleship. When we meet in small settings and homes and Bible studies and coffee shops, as, as we do life with one another, that's where we grow. We go, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? How's life going? A dinner, sitting at a table, that's a place for transformation. This corporate worship on a weekend is powerful. But if it's not followed up by a small, intimate, relational approach to sanctification and growing, it will never be what it could be if you would give yourself over to it. Because it'll clean you out. It'll just, just, just wash you. How does it work? Well, James 4, 8 puts it this way. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your, your hearts, you double-minded. I like how the message translation puts that when it says, say a quiet yes to God, and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. I love that because it's easy to kind of like, on Sunday, worship God, and then Friday this way. And it's like, put your right foot in, put your left foot out. I will love God a little bit and shake it all about, right? <laughs> and, and what he's saying is, no, come on, seek God with your heart. Draw near to God. Make that space for God. He'll clean your hands. He'll clean your heart. He'll change the way you think. He'll change what you value. He'll start making you love what he loves and hate what he hates. There's just a cleansing that happens. It starts to purify your heart, and you rise up. Uh, without regret. All right, Pastor Levi, let's go. Now, is he talking about fellowship here, like fellowship will help to cleanse and purify our hearts, or is it like the opposite, like we should be, you know, more purified and cleansed before we seek fellowship? I'm confused. I need help. <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, I think it's both and. Okay. Yeah, I think... Um, I think what he's intimating is that in the company of spiritual fellowship, we are strengthened. Okay. You know, we're strengthened. We, um, our spiritual life is renewed, all of that. So it's necessary for us to be in fellowship with okay. other spiritual people. Um, but at the same time, it is also important for us to have that quiet time where we allow God to process us alone. Okay. So that is through, you know, again, spiritual practices, yeah. you know, prayer, fasting, all of that. Because I was going to ask you too now, if, if this is the case, like, so let's say I have a friend that's super awesome, righteous guy, like, do, can his kind of good righteousness rub off on me and kind of help to scrub out my <laughs> impurities a little bit? Well, no, I think, I, I don't know that it'll scrub out your unrighteousness, <laughs> but I think, I think um, his model of behavior will rub off on you. Okay. You know, his right. ethics, his or her ethics. All right. Morality. Ethics and morality. Sounds good to me. We can all use a little more in our lives. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break. But when we come back, we have a special treat. Our producer, Brooke Gurley, sits with the cast of the new biopic, The Clark Sisters. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll be right back with Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, home of the next generation pastors. Recently, our producer, Brooke Gurley, sat with the cast of the new biopic, The Clark Sisters, The First Ladies of Gospel. Let's go ahead and check out some of the highlights of those interviews. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, guys! Come on, come on, come on, come on! Y'all got gifts to make you stars, but I'm gonna make you stars for Jesus. You want them to be the Jackson 5? No. They better than the Jackson 5. You gonna sing for the Lord, you gonna lay down for the devil. Great right, ladies, it's your time. She not gonna stay in this house, but I do my thing. Seventeen years ago, when uh, the Lord gave me the idea to get on a plane and go to Memphis, 
to meet with the Clark sisters and Bishop Shear to see if I can have this story. Um, it was at that point that I knew I was on a mission to try to bring a story to life, and it literally took about 17 years. And um, I didn't know why it was taking so long until I realized why Kiera had to grow up so she could play her mother. Um, but I, it also connected the idea that, you know, time, season, and purpose uh, makes all the difference in the world. And um, there was a time for this movie, and now is the time, especially in, a, in an era when the voice of the woman is being released, and we are more powerful, and we have more opportunity to um, impact the earth and culture with those things that matter. Yeah, I, I actually can say that I learned more about the the sisters overall than I did about my mom because I am so close with her. Uh, but I did learn that she did speak up at my grandmother's funeral more than she had done before. Um, and I think that was when I learned, oh, it's a ghetto side to you. So, uh, because I'm so used to her being so graceful and so poised and composed. And um, I've heard stories, but when I had to like be there and play it out, it's like, oh, she, she does respond. And because she is the youngest, very often people will, you know how when you're the youngest and you're usually quiet until something happens. Um, then she responds. So I'm like, okay, so I understand. So that was one thing that I, outside of her, you know, being the mother to me where she would hit us and we saw the heat of her. But seeing that as a young sister, it was like, okay, this is really cool. But the story of Auntie Twinkie and all of that is what really inspired me. Um, and, and seeing what my grandmother had gone through as far as being in a leading role in the church. Um, and then even kind of being crucified for going to the Grammys when to us is so much that is now accepted in gospel music when she was breaking, literally breaking barriers and she didn't even know for a day of when she would not be alive. Um, so those are the things that uh, stuck out to me and outside of my mom, uh, but the sisters and my grandmother. I, I can relate so much to uh, Twinkie and all that she's gone through actually. I was in a group and um, I was the lead of a group and um, it was so much stuff that just fell down on me um, to make sure that I did what I was supposed to do as that leader. Um, also, I'm divorced, a uh, single parent, so I understood um, a lot of where she um, came from and um, I understood the pressure of life and what people do as far as judge um, when things don't work out all the time. So uh, when you see this movie, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, but it was so incredible, the story that she um, has uh, and that she's overcome so many obstacles um, in her life. So I'm hoping that that scene and other scenes where tons of moments in the movie where you see a lot of strength and women standing up and taking risks, I think that's gonna be a big um, a teacher for, for that culture. Um, outside of, they'll be experiencing, you know, a really cool, you know, genre of music and, and the passion. Gospel music is so passionate and so fiery and you're gonna get a lot of those moments with the ladies here, so I'm thinking that's what they'll get. Thank you so much for those highlights, Brooke. And guys, make sure you check out April 11th, The Clark Sisters, the first ladies of gospel biopic on Lifetime. You don't want to miss it right now. We're going to get back to Pastor Fatty Omi. Let's go ahead and check them out. Essentially, what Jesus says to his disciples is, hey, if you want significance, well, it's found in serving. That significance is found in serving. It's not found in getting to a status or position or being the best mom in the neighborhood or the valedictorian. It's found in giving your life away to the people around you. And I don't know about you, but this is really good news for me. This is really, really, really good news. Because for me, that means I don't have to be a three-time Super Bowl winner to be important or to be significant. For me, it means I don't have to be the best mom in the neighborhood, dad, in the neighborhood, to be significant. I don't have to have the best grades, go to the best college, be the smartest person in the room in order to be significant. I just have to have a heart that's willing to serve. I love the way that Dr. Martin Luther King said this. He said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. 
You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. All you need is a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And you can be great. And you can find significance. And you can find meaning. It levels the playing field for all of us. And it says each and every one of us have an opportunity, have the potential to be significant in our world. So essentially what Jesus does is he calls his disciples together. And he goes, no, 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 no. This is the road to significance. This is the way to really matter. This is the way to get the thing that you're ultimately looking for. Significance isn't about climbing ladders. Significance is about becoming a ladder. Because if you want significance, that's how you find it. If you want to matter... That's how it happens. It's not that you climb the ladder to the top. It's that you become the ladder for someone else. I'm so happy that <clears throat> Pastor Fadiomi mentioned Martin Luther King because we're coming off of the heels of MLK Day. Mm. And he's, now look, this man served and served and there, he, there was not a vast amount of wealth. Yet everyone, including my children, can recite the mm. I Have a Dream speech I don't, and shout out to Apple, and, and Steve Jobs is a great guy, but nobody's reciting <laughs> his speeches at his Apple conferences. You, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So this serving, that reward, that level of just stamped in our lives forever, like can mm. we ever really hope to, you know, reach that kind of level of, of, of servitude and, and reward that mm. Martin kind of reached? Yeah. Yes and no. Okay. And so... I think all of us have been called to some level of service. Okay. And that level of service is very particular to who we are. It's particular to the graces that we've been given. Um, and so, yes, we can you know, strive and, and actually get to the level of service we're supposed to get to. Okay. Will, will all of us reach the level of service he reached? Yeah. No, because yeah. that was his particular call. Yeah, we're all not going to march on Selma. Right. You know, <laughs> you know. That was his journey. That was his call, yeah. yeah. Um, but all of us are called to serve um, to the best of our ability, to the best of our capacity. You know? And so we, we will do ourselves a disservice if we seek to, to serve at the level that he served at. Um, you may just be called to you know, be the cafeteria teacher or, you know, like, that is your service. So what does it mean for you to, um, to model good behavior, good service in front of these students? Okay. You know, um, wherever you are, that's your place of service. Be the best there. All right, yeah. I love that explanation. Be the best at what you're doing at wherever you're at because that's where God has you doing mm -hmm. your best works. And uh, with that, we're gonna take another quick break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. Yeah. Do you see that the message of the gospel isn't try, it's trust. It's not do, it's done. What should be our response to that? What should be our response to a God so good he would wash our hands for us without us doing anything? He stood there as a sheep before his shears is silent as Pilate washed, tried to wash the blood off of his hands, not realizing that you can't get out of making a decision about Jesus. Pastor Levi, let's go wrapping it up for us. And as we do at the end of every show, I like to ask our guests to give the people at home a uh, scripture that, or a piece of scripture that goes along with the clip that they just watched. Mm -hmm. Well, what comes to mind is Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, which talks about how we have been saved by grace through faith and not of any works of our own. As Pastor Levi said, uh, we don't have to try. We just have to trust. We don't have to keep doing. The work has already been done for us. We have to accept that work through faith. All right, that's great. Reverend Durrell. Uh, Pastor Durrell yes. now. Congratulations on the new <laughs> church. You. Hello, thank you for coming. Please come thank back you. again. Certainly. Sorry. All right, awesome. And to our partnering churches, Crossroads Community Church with Pastor Daniel Fusco, Fresh Life Church with Pastor Levi, and Mountain Lake Church with Pastor Gerald. Thank you guys for those inspiring messages. Please keep them coming. And thank you to the cast of the film, The Clark Sisters, the first 
Ladies of Gospel. It comes out April 11th at 8 p.m. on Lifetime, so be sure to check that out. To see the complete sermons and other great sermons, head over to ambotv.com. We always have great content there for you guys, and you can sign up for our newsletter. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you guys for watching. Good night. I love you, and I'll see you next week.